Hello and welcome to this podcast on uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, which is often abbreviated to WADA. Um, the learning objectives from this uh, session today are to look at the following aspects of WADA. So they are to consider who WADA are and what they do. They are to consider why we need uh, WADA or a World Anti-Doping Agency and uh, a code, which we'll come on to. Um, it's to consider what the factors were that led to the establishment of WADA uh, in 1999 and what was the situation in terms of uh, doping before 1999 in sport. And how WADA now interacts with other sports governing bodies across the world and what their role is within that kind of global sporting environment, which obviously links into our um, understanding global sport module. And then finally, we'll look at what are some of the successes and what are some of the criticisms of WADA today. So the purpose of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency and the World Anti-Doping Code, which it created, um, is to protect athletes' fundamental right to participate in doping-free sport and thus to promote health, fairness and equality for athletes worldwide and to ensure harmonised, coordinated and effective anti-doping programmes at the international and national level with regard to the prevention of doping, including education, deterrence, detection, enforcement and rule of law. And what's really quite important to know about WADA is that each country is uh, responsible or has to have their own organisation to enforce the code. So although WADA are the kind of global agency that are creating policies relating to doping, each country is expected to enforce the code in their own country. Um, I suppose it's also just worth touching upon why this might be relevant to you. Um, and it's probably quite important to know that um, not only are athletes bound by the, um, the rules and policies and codes that are put in place by WADA, but um, athlete support personnel are liable. So uh, you might go on to work in sports in a range of different guises. Um, and part of that might be um, working directly with athletes in some capacity. So you would be required to become familiar with what is involved in the WADA code um, and um, become au fait with what is uh, prohibited or what is uh, allowed within the WADA code. So the following offences under the WADA code are clearly applicable to the to the athlete support personnel. So as I say, people working within teams um, and clubs. So possession of a prohibited substance or method during a competition, um, possession of a prohibited substance or method during training athlete uh, uh, training, um, trafficking or attempted trafficking in any prohibited substance uh, or prohibited method. Um, administration or attempted administration to an athlete of any prohibited substance or method uh, during a competition and also um, uh, administration or attempted administration to an athlete of any prohibited substance or method out of competition. So really you would be required to have a full understanding as of when uh, you would be potentially liable as part of um, as part of a kind of a team, a wider team or athlete support team. Um, assisting, aiding, abetting or covering up or any other type of complicity involving an anti-doping rule violation uh, or any, any attempted anti-doping rule violation um, is, is considered really serious and would, would um, in, uh, result in sort of exclusion from a, a participation in events. There's sort of a kind of a bigger question as to why we need WADA and I suppose there's a kind of uh, moral uh, values based driven discussion um, to be had, but also doping can be dangerous and it endangers health. Um, it also compromises fair play, which comes back to this idea of the values of of uh, kind of a level playing field. Um, and we can tell that actually people are largely against doping uh, on a moral basis from the fallout of the Lance Armstrong scandal. So uh, back in 2013, sorry, uh, Lance Armstrong uh, received, you know, global condemnation when he admitted to having used doping to help secure all seven of his Tour de France victories. And it was a real kind of fall from grace for this uh, hero who had for many years um, developed and encouraged um, 
support of cycling but actually the way that his fall from grace um went about or took place shows that society does not tolerate the use of performance enhancing drugs and i think doping therefore poses a major problem for all sports organizations and their stakeholders ranging from corporate sponsors and media companies to public authorities so it affects the credibility of international sports competitions and the legitimacy of their policies so we we you know the the Lance Armstrong scandal has turned a lot of people off from cycling as well i think you you only need to uh, watch an interview with um uh, Dick Pound, uh, who was the former head of WADA, to show that actually he is now um, no longer interested in following um, cycling because of the fallout from the Lance Armstrong scandal. Um, Anti-doping programmes are sort of, you know, we're talking about this, this spirit of fair play and the spirit of sport and anti-doping programmes are founded on this intrinsic value of sport, this, uh, this kind of spirit of sport which is ingrained really within the the olympics movement as well this sort of ethical pursuit of human excellence through the dedicated perfection of each athlete's natural talent so we're trying to consider here how um doping might um stray away from that or be considered cheating or giving athletes an unfair advantage as it ends with this um spirit of sport that we're talking about and anti-doping programs really seek to maintain the integrity of sport in terms of respect for rules, other competitors, fair competition, a level playing field and the value of clean sport to the world. However, uh, this sort of narrative is not about critics and uh, there are well articulated sort of contrary philosophical positions concerning whether sport, particularly at a professional level, ought to be regulated for substance use at all. Um, and actually one of the things we'll talk about later when we look at perhaps some of the criticisms of WADA is whether this goes um, uh, too far and is too invasive as well. So if we just sort of take a step back and look at um, anti-doping pre-WADA, um, so before the setup of WADA, um, the International Olympic Committee, often referred to as the IOC, and the International Sports Federations each had their own regulations. And then a small number of governments had introduced national anti-doping legislation. So you can imagine we've got the IOC have got a kind of set of policies. And then you've also got international sports federations that have also got a set of policies around what's allowed, what's prohibited, um, how to go about testing in each of their sports. And then you've got governments as well that have also got some involvement in terms of doping as well. So there was this real kind of lack of harmony or consistency across um, anti-doping policy before the formation of WADA. There was also a kind of a serious lack of commitment to the fight against doping and a growing mutual distrust between governments and the sports world, which both had reasons to not take doping abuse too seriously. So if you think uh, about it from a governmental position, um, they would be uh, unlikely or perhaps likely to turn a blind eye if they have um, had a successful Olympic Games or a Commonwealth Games in which um, they've, they've been successful and won a number of medals. They would be unlikely to want to show that they have been won uh, on an unfair basis. Furthermore, you've also got sports uh, federations who previously have perhaps turned a blind eye to um, doping because it would be bad for their sport and actually you can look back to some of the the fallout from the, the aforementioned Lance Armstrong scandal to see cycling's involvement and actually how they had quite a lot of skin in the game in terms of keeping that narrative strong. Um, he was really good for the sport, he developed a lot of commercial interest in the sport so it wasn't in cycling's best interest um, for this to come clean. So you've got this situation really before WADA in which there was this real distrust between governments um, and actually no one was really too committed to taking doping seriously. Um, interestingly, the IOC was not uh, even the first sporting organisation to institute drugs tests. It was actually um, FIFA, the world governing body for football, who um, instituted drugs tests two years prior to the IOC. However, since the 1960s, the IOC had taken an increasingly central role in developing anti-doping policy in sport on a world level. Then, during the sort of 60s and early 70s, the IOC had seen its role as being limited to ensuring that local organising committees for the Olympic Games made arrangements for drug testing of competition, uh, competitors and more. Um, 
towards the end of the 70s and the start of the 80s, the IOC was increasingly adopting a policy sort of leadership role. Um, and this was around the creation of um, accredited laboratories for the analysis of samples and the creation of a list of banned substances in practice, producing the first such list in 1971. So they're starting to take a more prominent position in terms of being this um, uh, leader within the, the, the kind of um, fight against doping. Um, and in the years prior to the formation of WADA, the reputation of the IOC as the defender of drug-free sport was under attack due to desire to keep a particular image of the Olympics for commercial purposes. So we mentioned there about cycling, but actually this wasn't um, uh, wasn't just cycling. There was also a number of issues with the IOC. Um, and you could look to um, a bit of uh, reading for you would be um, spitting in the soup, uh, which looks at how the first profitable Olympic Games in LA took place but actually, they, once there was a, there was evidence to suggest that there might have been some positive samples that were found, but quickly disappeared because they wanted to maintain the reputation of this having been a clean Olympic Games um, due to its commercial success. So there was a kind of, again, a, a bit of mistrust as to whether or not the IOC was hugely committed to being this defender of drug-free sport. Um, so the real kind of catalyst for the formation of WADA was again tied to cycling. Uh, the Festina affair, uh, as it's so so um, kind of is, is now called, uh, Festina were the producer of, of watches, but got involved in cycling um, and was sponsoring a team. And there was kind of um, a huge scandal when French police, so it wasn't even the cycling um, uh, committee or, or federation, it was actually the French government that um, raided the Festina team and found a number of uh, um, uh, doping equipment, um, EPO equipment within the boots of cars and found the Festina team had been doping. Um, and this really kicked off a bit of a scandal and as Houlihan has noted, much of the policy making in the area of drugs and sport has been scandal driven. So very reactive rather than proactive and often coming from a quite a negative position rather than um, uh, from a kind of positive position of wanting to do it um, from a kind of good standpoint. So there was this kind of fallout following this, this scandal in 1999. Um, and then there was the need to, to hold this meeting in Lausanne. Uh, the 1999 World Conference on Doping in Sport, which was kind of um, to bring all of these different stakeholders and different partners together to discuss the future of anti-doping. Um, I haven't watched the tour. And what I'll do is I will leave this video um, in the slides so you can go and have a, a look at this later on. But this is basically just a look back at the, the 1998 Tour de France and the, the Festina team affair. So we've kind of established there was this mutual distrust between governments and international sports organisations, and this is really where the establishment of WADA took place. Moreover, this conference in Lausanne that was held, um, was called, was held at a time when the IOC's credibility had been further weakened by the fallout from the Salt Lake City corruption scandal, in which a number of members of the IOC had been uh, accused of taking gifts from the Salt Lake Organising Committee during the bidding process for the hosting of the 2002 Summer Olympics. So it was, the IOC were kind of approaching this from a position of weakness in which a number of people were quite sceptical about the, um, the morals or the, the kind of ethical standpoint of the IOC. And I think it's fair to say it's sort of well documented the IOC thought that actually this conference would see them really formalize this sort of leadership position they were trying to create for themselves uh, as the kind of defender of, of um, sports and, and cre the creation of a drugs free sport. But actually the conference ended with much greater resistance than the IOC had uh, predicted uh, to their attempts to kind of retain this leadership position. Um, and they had wanted to create this kind of IOC-led anti-doping agency. However, governments were actually really insistent upon a really independent anti-doping agency, which is what became WADA. So something independent and separate from the IOC. Um, so there was a real desire to ensure that this, in, this agency, WADA, was separate from the IOC and other sports organisations. 
Um, and actually, Canada was successful in its lobby to situate WADA's permanent headquarters in Montreal and not Lausanne, where the IOC is based. So even though that was quite a minor thing, the fact that they had an office in Canada, um, not Lausanne, where the IOC was based, so wasn't under kind of um, within the same, situated in the same location, was kind of considered to be quite a win and actually a sign that this was going to be a separate independent organization and kind of free from the influence of the IOC. And what we had really was the establishment of WADA and the kind of there was a real positive feeling towards WADA, the speed of acceptance of the anti-doping code, which it created in 2003 by international sports organizations and this kind of rapid ratification by governments of the 2005 UNESCO Convention Against Doping in Sport created this impression of a commitment to the ideals of a drug-free sport. So it was a real positive feeling that actually WADA and the code that they had created was going to be great for sport and was going to solve a lot of the problems that were associated with um, tackling doping. Um, we will discuss how that has panned out and whether that has sort of come to fruition from 2005 uh, a little bit later on. But it's probably now just important to have a look at what WADA actually does and what is the code and what are some of the things that um, constitutes WADA. So actually, if we look at it holistically, the World Anti-Doping Programme encompasses all of the elements needed to ensure optimal harmonisation and best practice um, within anti-doping programmes. So there's kind of three levels. The main elements of this are the code, which we're going to spend most of the time um, discussing or looking at in a bit more detail. Then we've got international standards and technical documents. Um, and then we've got the models of best practice and guidelines. We're not going to spend too much time um, looking at those today, but if you are interested um, or end up working in sport, these are things that you will um, need to sort of become familiar with. Um, so the World Anti-Doping Code is probably the main thing that most people are, are kind of familiar with when, it, when, when thinking about WADA. And the code is the kind of the fundamental and universal document upon which the, the World Anti-Doping uh, Programme in, in sport is based. And it provides the overall framework for anti-doping policies, rules and regulations within sports organisations and amongst public authorities. Uh, it was accepted after extensive consultation amongst all stakeholders and came into effect as of the 1st of January 2004. Um, if countries or sporting organisations weren't able to comply or fail to comply with the code, they might be rendered ineligible for bids related to the Olympic Games or major international events. So countries had to sign up and approximately 700 sports organisations have all accepted the World Anti-Doping Code. And what that means in terms of accepting that code is actually that the signatory, so those 700 bodies we spoke about, agrees to the principles of the code and then agrees to implement and comply with the code. Once they've signed the code, they then need to implement it. And then the implementation of this is to make sure that it amends its rules and policies, to harmonize it with the code, to make sure that what they're talking about within their countries is in line with the code. And then finally, they actually need to go about enforcing it as well. So making sure that actually people are abiding by the laws and they're, they're monitoring um, the competitions in which are taking place within their country and that these are happening um, in line with the code. So if we think about what is actually part of the code and what what can what is considered to be a violation of it. So we, we've got the presence of a prohibited substance in an athlete sample, and there's a list of uh, prohibited substances that WADA um, regularly updates. We've got use or attempted use by an athlete of a prohibited substance or a prohibited method. Um, evading, refusing or failing to submit a sample uh, collection by an athlete. Evading sample collection or refusing uh, or failing to submit to sample collection without compelling justification or tampering or attempted tampering with any part of doping control by an athlete or another person. Then we've got actually having possession of a prohibited substance um, by an athlete or an af athlete support person, as we mentioned earlier, that personnel support team perhaps. Trafficking or attempted trafficking of um, substances, so not even necessarily taking it, but actually having it on possession. Um, we've got uh, complicity or attempted complicity by an athlete of another person, prohibited association by an athlete or another person, 
or these final two, which I just want to take a, a perhaps a minute to look at in a little bit more depth. So we have this second from last one, which is acts by an athlete or other person to discourage or retaliate against reporting to authorities. And actually what this means is, is threatening um, or trying to uh, prevent somebody from uh, uh, being a whistleblower, essentially. So if somebody had some information that they wanted to come uh, and announce to WADA or within their, their kind of country's um, uh, framework for, for anti-doping, um, if they were discouraged from doing this by an individual, that would be considered to be a violation of the of the code. And what's quite interesting is if you um, if you go back and watch some of the stuff that happened within Lance Armstrong's career, there's actually a moment on film. It's captured on film. It's during a race where there is a, a, a racer, a cyclist um, who is threatening to sort of open up about um, and reveal some of the secrets of what's going on within cycling. And there's a moment in a race where Lance Armstrong actually slows down to go to talk to him live on cameras, captured on camera, and he threatens to um, hurt him or ruin his career, I think is actually what he says. He threatens to ruin his career if he comes clean about the, the doping violations. And that's pretty shocking that he had the audacity to do that knowing that he was watched on camera and knowing that this was a violation of the code and if you go back and watch um, there's a documentary about Lance Armstrong on the BBC um, it's really interesting to see that um, we have this uh, guy so brazen about um, uh, cheating but also threatening somebody to, who was who was um, uh, discussing the, the the potential of coming clean to the authorities uh, and the final one here is one that we're going to spend a little bit of time just touching on, which is the whereabouts failures by an athlete. So what does that mean? So we've got this whereabouts rule um, <clears throat> and the anti-doping code revised the whereabouts system in 2004 under uh, under which as of 2014 athletes are required to select one hour per day, seven days a week to be available for a no notice drugs test. So somebody could just come up and take a sample from an athlete. And it's been challenged for a number of reasons. Um, and it's been unsuccessfully challenged at law in 2009 by the Belgian Sports Union, who argued that actually this is a, a kind of a violation of the European Convention of Human Rights and by FIFPRO, who's the age of the, um, the umbrella group for football players unions. And their base, their main argument is that this is this is kind of a violation of um, privacy. It's very invasive. It's almost 1984 style monitoring of people having to know where they are all the time. And there's quite an interesting case study um, and what I'll do is um, once I post these slides, the if you click the video, it will give it will take you, <coughs> excuse me, it will take you on a link to a video on Boxer Broadcast, which you can use your University of Sterling email address to log into um, and have a look at. And it's a case study of Christine Oriogu um, looking at how she uh, was, un she well, she missed free, free tests of the whereabout rule. So she was never found guilty of taking drugs, um, but three times they turned up at a place where she said she was going to be and she missed the test and she was banned for a, a number of years, which was quite a big blow to um, the British Olympic uh, team at the time. Um, with the 2012 Olympic Games coming up because she was a, a girl from Stratford, um, uh, obviously where the Games were held in 2012. So quite an interesting case study to have a look at there. She was eventually allowed to compete again, but she was she faced a ban for, for a while. Um, what I would like you to do at this point is encourage you to um, scan that QR code on, on screen if you want to pause the video and do so. Um, and there's a little quiz that you can do on the WADA website, 10 questions relating to how well you know the WADA code. It's quite um, uh, a useful little exercise to become more familiar with what the code, uh, what's involved in the code. It's also a discussion that you could have if you're um, if you're with someone just now um, relating to this, which is the the case of uh, Mark Dry, who was a Scottish hammer thrower who was suspended for four years for a breach of the doping rules. Uh, he was 32 at the time. He won bronze medals at the 2014 and 2000 Commonwealth Games, um, and he admitted lying about his whereabouts at initial hearing before um, a national anti-doping panel. Um, in October last year. The panel dismissed the charge against Dry, but UK Anti-Doping appealed that decision. 
And I guess there's a, a question here is where do you sit on this fence? Do you feel like this whereabout rule is um, invasive or do you think actually this is a quite a fair and reasonable thing to expect from athletes? And this is quite a good, interesting discussion to have around whether or not you think that this is, you know, the means is justified in this case. So it'd be good to just touch upon how successful WADA have been. Um, and there's probably a number of things that we can point to or look at in terms of um, positive impact that WADA has had. So if we look at the, the state of doping up until the formation of WADA, drugs testing under the IOC had proved relatively unsuccessful in catching athletes. And if we look at drugs testings at the Olympic Games between um, 1968 and 1996, there was just 52 positive drug tests in a, an athlete population of around 54,000 or less than one positive case per thousand. Now, using the statistics that we, we're kind of familiar with and we can touch upon in a bit, that's incredibly low for what is su suspected of, of the kind of prevalence of, of, of doping. Um, and it's also probably worth reinforcing as well that in the years preceding that, the conference that took place in Lausanne, doping cases at the Olympics did not appear to be too troublesome. Um, and there'd been just seven cases associated with the 1996 Games, 15 with the 2000, but by 2004, um, and by, you know, which point WADA in place, this had jumped up to 27. So they had become more, more uh, positive cases had been sort of found by this point. And certainly when the IOC ran anti-doping for the Olympics, there are teams that, you know, there appears to have been vested interest and a lack of independence at a national level, leading to allegations of cover-ups to reduce the number of scandals. And again, I'll just highlight um, that book, Spitting in the Soup, um, which talks about the cover-up of the 1984 uh, Games in LA um, and why they were so keen to cover this up for the kind of commercial um, interests as well. So in that sense, WADA at least seems to have ensured that positive cases are made public, um, so as and when uh, positive cases were found, and that there is potentially, or uh, I'll say, uh, say uh, some element of independence, and I'll do that because uh, some of the criticisms will come to. Um, if we continue to think about some more of the successes that WADA has had, already by 2005, one of the kind of um, sharpest anti-doping policy critics, John Hoberman, had noted that WADA had achieved a credibility that the IOC had never really managed to generate in terms of um, anti-doping, and it managed to develop into an organisation with a distinct legitimate identity that is now considered indispensable in a system that pursues a doping-free world of sport. So it has created this image of, of being independent and actually being really committed to tackling doping. And what the code has done is ensured a significant degree of harmonization and note the, the terminology there, significant degree rather than um, complete harmonization in, in anti-doping policy. It's also laid the foundation for closer cooperation between governments and sports organizations on the doping problem. Um, and as we mentioned, there's sort of around over 600 or at least 700 um, sports organisations, including the IOC, and by far the majority of national governments worldwide have all signed up to this code. However, um, you know, we need to be um, open minded that actually uh, it's not perfect and it's not um, it's not without its criticisms. So actually, um, one of the main criticisms of WADA is that the deterrents just aren't strict enough. And we can use the example here of Justin Gatlin, as shown on screen here on the right, who was found not once but twice to have used illegal substances. The first time round, his punishment was reduced to one year about athletics and the second time it was reduced to four years. Um, however, he still managed to come back and compete at the top level Olympic Games and win medals. So despite these bans that he was still able to come back and compete. So the deterrent obviously wasn't strong enough to prevent him from doing it the first time. Um, and he's still been able to come back and compete. So there's questions as to whether or not this demonstrates whether WADA have completely failed to establish a real deterrent around doping and whether the punishments are, are harsh enough. Um, and actually, despite some of those positives and the optimism that was generated by establishment of WADA at the beginning, 
there is a lot more skepticism and that much of the commitment was kind of superfluous and and merely um, politics of appearance rather than a real commitment and actually acting on this uh, desire to actually catch drugs cheats. Um, and there is still a criticism that major international federations are still placing commercial interests ahead of a commitment to anti-doping. Um, and as we can look at uh, the UCI, which is um, the, the cycling uh, federation, their reform commission report that was published following the revelations regarding doping by Lance Armstrong. As I mentioned earlier, the UCI had um, for, pre for many years previously seen Lance Armstrong as that perfect choice to lead the sports renaissance after the Festina scandal. And actually, they were kind of complicit in, in trying to cover up some of the, uh, the scandal themselves. Another piece of recommended watching for you. Again, you can use your University of Sterling login to access this on Box of Broadcasts. Um, uh, Chris O'Dowell, uh, as pictured here, uh, plays a, this is obviously a true story, uh, plays a journalist who is convinced by uh, the fact that uh, Lance Armstrong has, has been cheating. This isn't necessarily um, tied to WADA, but is perhaps um, representative or reflective of some of the issues that WADA has in, tr in terms of trying to uh, create kind of harmonization um, across all sports and across the world. Really, really interesting story and looks a lot of the kind of commercial interests and how that gets in the way of create the creation of this level playing field. Um, if we continue to look at perhaps some of the critiques and criticisms of WADA, um, there's uh, there's a strong argument to say that um, athletes or there's there's evidence to sh show when athletes have been declined medical use of drugs because they're on the prohibited list so they're not able to get drugs that are on the WADA code or prohibited list even in cases when they can present evidence from doctors that their health is at risk if they're not permitted access to the drugs in question um, so it's um, considered to be unfair in that sense um, the system also fails to produce standardization and fairness Consequently, there has been an inconsistency between sanctions accorded to similar violations. So we looked at some of those punishments and whether or not they've always been considered fair. Um, and then a central ambition of WADA has always been about this kind of this idea of harmonization. So um, bringing all the different governing bodies around the world together. However, this is very reliant upon countries having the same proportion of resources to commit to anti-doping, um, of being relied upon to deliver independent testing and sanctions, and in fact, to actually have a culture that supports anti-doping. So this is very much um, based on the assumption of the set of values set out by middle class Western men in developed countries that want to kind of that have this idealism around the amateur sort of pursuit of sporting excellence in the spirit of sport which was been, has been instilled really from the Western world. And actually what they're trying to do is create this narrative and expect everyone to have the same values. Um, and there's a kind of criticism that kind of perhaps not all, not everyone does want this. And actually this is being dictated to the rest of the world um, by predominantly the West. Another kind of um, criticism lies in the, 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 the kind of um, scale of success in which WADA has had in actually catching treat, uh, uh, drugs cheats. So if we look at some recent research, it's by WADA. WADA themselves reported figures for adverse analytical findings of between 1.08 in 2008 and 1.6 in 2016 uh, in terms of positive cases. Um, however, uh, more recent research suggests that these figures are actually quite a poor indication of the true extent of doping, which is estimated to be 25% or higher. So there was research by um, Al Richie uh, in 2018, which was conducted at the 2011 World Championships in Athletics and at the Pan Arab Games, which reported that actually, um, which asked athletes to self-declare whether or not they had been doping. So it wasn't based on biological testing, but it was based on speaking with athletes um, with their sort of um, confidentiality insured. Um, and they can, they reported that they obtained strikingly high estimates of the prevalence of past year doping at both events. So, um, this, so the 43 percent at the um, championships, the world championships in athletics um, and 57 percent at the Pan Arab Games. That is the percentage of athletes who had um, admitted to having doped in the past year. So huge variance between the number of positive um, cases that are found by WADA 
versus the, actually the prevalence of doping. Um, so if we perhaps summarize some more of those criticisms, um, we've got success is very reliant upon each country's and its sports governing bodies enforcing rules and regulations. Um, we can look at Russia as a really interesting example here, um, and we'll look at them in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, we've got a criticism that although it aims for harmonization, that's very reliant upon each country having the resources and the desire effectively to deliver independent testing and sanctions, which can come at considerable resource. Um, there's a criticism that WADA is not independent because of funding and governance, which we will um, come to as well. Um, and we've got some of the regulations themselves, which are considered invasive, such as the whereabout rules, or considered to be ineffective, like um, athletes not being able to access substances on the prohibited list, despite having a medical case for it. Um, we've also had, got the factors mentioned there around some of the figures or a poor indication of the true extent of doping. Um, and we've also got the fact that no matter a kind of fundamental, and it's more, hence why I've left it at the end here, uh, fact that no matter how tight the rules have become, doping abuses come keep coming to light, ranging from use at individual level to large scale state supported doping programs. And actually, there's an argument that those that are doping will always be one step ahead of those that are trying to catch, and there will always come up with new ways to come around and get around the system. Um, if we take the case of Russia, we've mentioned them just there. Um, this kind of crisis around Russia and doping started in 2014, and this is perhaps uh, indicative of some of the problems with WADA. When, a, when the German public TV channel ARD broadcast an alarming documentary about Russian doping practices on the basis of anonymous tips, secret recordings and whistleblowers testimonies and actually became much worse. So there was a little uh, period in between and it got much worse in May 2016 when the former head of the Moscow anti-doping laboratory, Grigory Redech, uh, sorry, Redjenko, uh, disclosed doping practices during the Sochi 2014 Olympic Games. So he'd been the head of the labs and he had then come clean um, and become a whistleblower effectively and disclosed how Russia had been going about um, avoiding positive drugs tests. Um, and investigations initiated by WADA in response to these testimonies confirmed that this had been true and substantiated the media, the image outlined in the media. So it really had this huge fallout after it was revealed that um, Russia had been cheating in 2014, the kind of elaborate way in which they had done so. And actually, the problem we have is because we're WADA are reliant on countries um, enforcing the code and the practices within their country. If a country doesn't want to do so or wants to create a way to get around the system, it can be quite easy for them to do so. So actually, this whole cover up was a coordinated policy from the Russian Ministry of Sport, the Russian Federal Security Service, the Russian Olympic Committee, the Russian National Sports Federations, the National Anti-Doping Agency, and the WADA accredited Moscow and Sochi laboratories. So they were all complicit in this kind of web of, of cover-up as well. And that made it very easy for them to evade essentially detection from WADA. And it took several whistleblowers to expose this scheme. It wasn't picked up by WADA on their own sort of policing efforts. So a real criticism here that actually um, that um, um, positive cases are found by whistleblowers rather than WADA's own, own um, enforcement. Um, again, there's a link here to the picture of, of um, the head of the, the Russian labs. Um, and that will take you to a, a, a short video on YouTube, which I'd recommend. But despite a broad call to act, the IOC decided to admit individual Russian athletes under a neutral flag. They decided that it wasn't fair that if an athlete hadn't uh, could demonstrate that they hadn't um, tested positive, they should be allowed to compete under a neutral flag in Rio 2016 um, at, the, at the Winter Olympic Games. Um, in 2018 as well. And there was an unanimous, unanimous decision by WADA in September 2018 to declare um, Russia compliant again, so their own um, anti-doping agency compliant again. And this was also heavily criticized. They were allowed to fully participate in international sports again from 2018. But critics really kind of said that this was WADA coming to Russia's, or Russia's power and pressure from the IOC. And WADA has been really criticized for how it's handled this particular affair um, but uh, despite that, virtually none of the critics have called for it to be sort of um, 
um, torn up. And we also just want to have a quick look here about, despite the fact there was this real concerted effort to ensure that WADA was an independent organization and sort of a distinct body and separate from, from the IOC, there have been criticisms of it that it this is this has sort of been brought into question really. So we've got 50% of the IOC, um, sorry, 50% of WADA is funded by the IOC, which represents just 2% of the IOC's revenue. Um, so this kind of this question of funding is quite is very reliant. And if you go, if you think about sort of some of the um, concepts that would be um, tied to this, like around resource dependency theory, quite interesting to see how reliant and how dependent they are upon the IOC for their funding and their resource. But there's also a question around its governance. So not only funding, but actually several key positions held by one or two members at WADA and CASC, which is the Court for Arbitration and Sport, are often held at the same time, and uh, the IOC as well. So if you have a look at this diagram, you can see this kind of network of individuals and the governance structures in which they take. Um, and you know, you can see here how many of them also sit on the IOC board or um, the uh, CAS board as well. And this really raises questions of conflicts of interest and whether WADA could ever truly be an independent organization. So how can we kind of summarize this? Well, it's now 25 years since that Festina scandal happened at the 1998 Tour de France, which led to the creation of WADA essentially. Um, and there is little sense that progress has been made to perhaps stop the most ambitious athlete and their support personnel from taking the logic of sport to a degree that transgresses the rules laid out in the WADA code. So despite the fact we now have this code, it's still happening and actually um, on quite a, 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 a large scale as demonstrated by some of the numbers that have come out as demonstrated by the, the, the Russia scandal as well. Um, and we've got doping has continued throughout this period since WADA was established and given the responsibility to reduce the extent and nature of cheating through doping, various forms of evidence suggest that global sport still has a major challenge in preventing the misuse of drugs, despite the economic and political resources devoted to anti-doping and the high cost for clean athletes, inadverted dopers and deliver dopers. However, if we were to leave on a perhaps a slightly more optimistic note, um, as Bottenberg has, has argued, that actually being successful for WADA is not necessarily about just purely the number of positive cases they are able to detect or, or stamp out the, the, the level of which they stamp out doping, but it's actually about them being the guardians of the values and the spirit of the World Anti-Doping Code. And actually they argue that they have been successful in gaining a reputation and a legitimacy as an institution that is separate from the IOC um, and is kind of the, the kind of leader in this, this fight against drugs in sport. And actually, we can also say that the anti-doping regime is becoming more strict. Um, the cost of this policy are increasing and the privacy of athletes is coming under increasing pressure. So while it, can't, it cannot be demonstrated that the policy is becoming more effective in reducing doping in sport, um, it's kind of another matter really. But on the whole, there is now a body that is looking at these issues in more detail, creating standards, creating practices that weren't in place before. Um, and there are now more successfully courts or positive uh, cases brought to light um, than previously. So um, I suppose to summarize, there are certainly a number of good things that have, have taken place since WADA's introduction. Um, but also it's not without its criticisms. So I hope you find that um, a useful uh, overview of, of WADA and the World Anti-Doping Agency and Code. Um, I will share the slides um, and uh, I look forward for any questions that, that might come from it. Okay, thank you.